Welcome to the British Library and to Feminist Loose Ends. This is the event that marks the end of the library's big exhibition, Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights. And we're going to have a discussion of that marathon piece of work, along with the sharing of two very exciting new books um, on that subject. I'm B. Rolat of the cultural events team. Um, let's meet the panel. First of all, I'd like to introduce you to Polly Russell. Hi, Polly. Polly's head of the Eccles Centre for America's Studies at the British Library, but she's here in her capacity as the lead curator of the exhibition. So she's going to kick off her curatorial boots and tell us what it was really like. You might also know her from her History Cook column in the FT. Great piece in the current FT magazine. And uh, she also presents on BBC Two's Back in Time. So food and feminism. What else is there, Polly? <laughs> uh, next is Rafia. Hello, Rafia. Rafia Zakaria is a lawyer, human rights activist, and author of, amongst other things, Against White Feminism. This isn't the real cover. The real cover is very much more beautiful This because it's a review copy. The actual book comes out in the UK on the 9th of September and we're putting a pre-order link onto the platform so that you can pre-order the book now. Um, so, uh, Rafia is currently a research scholar at the Colin Powell Centre for Civic Leadership at City College, New York. Uh, we're also joined by Alison Phipps. Alison's been a scholar activist in the movement against sexual violence for over 15 years. She's currently Professor of Gender Studies at Sussex University, but soon to be moving to Newcastle University to be Professor of Sociology. So I'm glad to catch you in between. And she's here to talk about this book, her new work, Me, Not You, The Trouble with Mainstream Feminism. We're also going to be hearing later on from writer Shelley Mitchell of The Outsiders Project. More on her soon. But first, Polly, can I come to you? What is Unfinished Business? What is the exhibition? So Unfinished Business, thanks so much, B. This is just wonderful to be able to talk about the exhibition with you and Rafia and Alison. I'm really excited to have a conversation because what this exhibition is about is it is a landmark exhibition at the British Library, which was trying to connect the current moment of feminist activism and engagement with women's history with a longer history of that. And because it's trying to tell a really big story, it's really ambitious. It's slightly different from other exhibitions that have taken place in this kind of subject area where they've tended to focus in on, for instance, women and suffrage or women and work or a specific area of uh, the women's rights story. This is trying to tell a big ambitious story. And so because of that, there are of course gaps. I think of it like a mosaic in a way. You could rearrange this story in different ways. You could tell it in different ways. It's not definitive, but it's a kind of invitation into a big conversation. And that's what we wanted to do. And from the very start, from, from the get-go, there were some sort of concepts which were sort of at the, at the core of the way we were thinking, although lots of it changed in our three years of planning. A couple of things really- Three were, years. Three years, three, three long years. Well and another year if you add on the COVID chaos. So yeah, it's been a long time. Uh, but, but one of the things that was kind of central to our conceptual thinking was this idea that there never has been and there never will be one sort of woman, that what it means to be a woman has always been contested. It's me meant different things, experiences of varied, experiences of progress, but also experiences of oppression uh, and freedoms take place at different times for different women. So this was never going to be a kind of chronological story or a positivist story which is just of progress but it's it's a version of a story that it could you could tell it in different ways but the point is it's about a kind of complexity um, the second thing is that for space reasons uh, we had to focus on the UK and kind of 19th century onwards we would love to have told a story which was much more able to tell a story of the world because this is not just the UK story of course but because of Britain's colonial links and also links of slavery, we were able, and also the British Library's collections, we were able to draw in stories that connect to the rest of the world. So it is sort of UK in a broad centered sense of that. It's got 150 objects in it. That was selected from a long list of probably about 700, which was torturous to oh. choose. Um, that is we, horrible. That's like picking your favorite kid. It was like choosing a favorite. In fact, choosing a favorite kid would be easier, I think. Um, 
I know because I've got three. And um, we organized this massive story into three sort of overarching sections, body, mind and voice, in recognition that those are the areas over which women have historically and, and continue to struggle for agency and freedom um, and the sort of right to live a fully right, realized life. And then each of those sections is broken down into three more. So there's nine sections altogether. So for sake of argument, the body section splits into image, biology and autonomy. And each one of those is headed up by a contemporary activist organization that's campaigning in that, in that sphere or in that area. So for instance, in the section on protest and partnership, we have women for refugee women. Um, in the section on work, we have United Voices of the World Union. Um, in biology, we have Bloody Good Period, who campaigned for um, period, uh, the end of period poverty. Um, and we asked each of them to curate their own cases so that they were telling their own stories of their own activism. It's very much a myriad entity, isn't it? When you go in, and apologies for anybody that's not in London, um, but you, when, when you enter it, and there are two more weeks of the exhibition, you, the first thing you, you meet is a sort of mix of voices, and that's deliberate, isn't it? Yeah, we really wanted the, ex we did not want it to be kind of mausoleum-like and sort of reverential as a space. We wanted it to be loud, colourful, uh, disruptive, uh, joyful, but we wanted people to feel angry and happy in a, in a sense to kind of reflect the story that we were trying to tell as well. So it really is quite kind of in your face in terms of sound and also in terms of what you see as well. That's right. And I should also add, um, there are two more weeks to see it. It's free on Tuesdays if you're in London town. But for viewers that are joining us via the Living Knowledge Network, which is the British Library's friends and relatives around the country, um, there is also a travelling version that, that, that continues on beyond the end of the exhibition. So it does have an onwards life. Because how does it feel, Polly, to bring something together that is so precious? It's such a snapshot. And to know that it comes apart again. Well, um, it... But I, I don't even, I haven't got a metaphor for it yet, for what it feels like. It's been an amazing project to work on. We've made, worked with some fantastic partners, amazing, an amazing advi advisory board of sort of academic citizen researchers, activists. Um, as you say, it's the work in the library, the kind of exhibition in the library is just kind of one part of that work. So it is a kind of centerpiece, but then there's the Living Knowledge Network, which went out to 22 libraries across the UK, where they we, we sent them panels and then they supplemented them with their own kind of exhibitions and events that were you know, related to their own kind of areas, uh, events and histories. We've done an amazing website with digitizing objects from the exhibition and then telling all sorts of kind of histories and stories around that from like the history of women in cycling to disability mm. activism to so many different working parts. And then, of course, the pandemic hit. <laughs> what was the impact of that? And also, what did that mean in terms of the relevance of the exhibition? Yeah, it's really, I think it's been really um, interesting. I mean, this history is a very live history or this story is a live story. It's been, it's not just the pandemic. It was changing even before the pandemic, you know, so three years ago, four years ago is a different, it's a different country to today. If you think about some issues, I mean, I'd say something like when we started, for instance, there was a mu much less hysterical attention around trans issues than there is now. On the other hand, I think people, a broad audience, are more accepting and understanding of trans issues now. So, you know, that's just one example of how the landscape has changed. So this is, you know, there's never going to be finished business. That was a good thing about doing this exhibition. Um, it was always unfinished. It was always in flux. But it's absolutely true that COVID, you know, it closed down the ex exhibition. So it closed us down in one sense, but it absolutely thrust into the limelight many of the issues that the exhibition is trying to highlight, you know, issues of kind of structural inequality, a recognition that, you know, freedoms are never, never have been experienced equally. And, you know, everyone will know that COVID impacted disproportionately on, on women because they bear the burden of care work and domestic work and precarious jobs. And that that especially impacted on women of color for who are more likely to work in that sector. And then, so we had COVID and then at the same time, you know, Black Lives Matter, also heightened this recognition uh, of, the, of taking into the need, the imperative to take into account black lives of diverse lives as a kind of absolute insistence on that. And so it feels to me like since we reopened, audiences have come in a sense with, with more open minds or perhaps more of a sense of the urgency of the issues that are being discussed in the exhibition. 
And how do you, I mean, how do you actually see that as, as a shifting dynamic? How then do you see the role of, of feminism in the public domain? Is it a snapshot or is it a process? Yeah, I mean, I really, really want to hear what Rafia and Alison have to say about this, because it seems to me that both of them have written to you in just a moment. So. Absolutely about feminism in the public realm, you know, the, and the, their work is like deep analysis and then also kind of solutions and how we can think about moving forward. Um, so I don't want to talk about the role of <laughs> public feminism. I'll talk about a role and a case study, which I think is unfinished business. And, you know, uh, I think it's really crucial to think about who needs to come to the table to do public culture? And in the case of unfinished business, you know, that was a mixture of our internal teams, expertise within, you know, on the marketing or exhibition teams or curatorial teams, but then also working with, you know, advisors, you know, people who could, campaigners, nonprofits, citizen researchers. So it's kind of bringing into that conversation as many people and voices as possible. You know, it absolutely came out of a commitment to gender equality, to highlighting structural inequalities and a kind of commitment to women. But it was very much shaped by an idea of public culture, both shaping, shaping debate, but debate shaping public culture. And I think in the way that feminism makes you live your life differently, it makes you think about history differently, it makes you do curation differently as well. And I think it's unsettled for us or forced us up against to get any idea that, you know, the, the curator or the library as the expert, as the definitive answer into something, actually it requires us to kind of give up and seed space for different stories and to let the subjects of history speak for themselves and to allow for sort of different and divergent views. So I think that's what we've tried to do. And I think- okay. I, want to, I want to turn now to, to Raffia, if I may, Raffia. Um, Polly's just explained the reasoning behind why the exhibition was limited to, to, to the UK facing um, history of, of, of women's rights. But you're in, in, in your book, which I just want to bring up on screen again, Against White Feminism, you're very emphatic about the need to look outside of European and American perspective. I mean, can you tell us why did you write the book? Here's my book. Um, sorry for being muted and thank you. Uh, B and Polly for uh, giving me uh, the chance to be included in the discussion. Um, and I think B, your question about why I ask, uh, you know, or why I make such an emphatic case for um, that feminism is to be found elsewhere is because as someone who grew up in Karachi in Pakistan, um, you know, I received a very uh, patchy and contested version of my own history. So I think um, when I grew up and as a scholar, uh, the decolonizing work uh, that is essential for, you know, millions of people like myself, women, especially to recover their own history is to provide them with the access to, you know, the sort of epistemic collection that the British Library represents. So, um, because, you know, our histories were lost, um, you know, they, they were lost in partition, they were lost before that, they were, um, you know, they're not available to us. But before we, um, before I go any further, I wanted to point out why I find Polly's perspective so interesting. Uh, my book, uh, Against White Feminism, begins with the story of a different exhibition, um, you know, and, and, and um, it looks, the, the, that exhibition in particular is the World's Fair of 1893 that was, uh, that took place in Chicago. And this was a time when um, women did not, women, American women did not yet have the vote. And the sort of startling thing that happened or, or, or the kind of uh, curveball that came um, to these women was that uh, the, the men who were leading the Colombian uh, exposition said for the first time that um, there could be a, a special exhibit uh, devoted just to women. And this was going to be called the Women's Building. And um, 
so began the task of this board of women, the lady managers, they were called, and their um, effort to sort of encapsulate and then present, um, you know, what the achievements and uh, the skills and talents of American women were. And the point, of course, being to, sh to show to, uh, you know, America and to the rest of the world uh, just how modern uh, the country was and how forward looking it was. But of course, um, you know, if you look in the story of, of that exhibition, I'll just move on to like how it ended up, what ended up being the result of this exhibition. First of all, there were, there were tremendous squabbles, right, within figuring out what represents America, this question of what represents America. And now, even though uh, Black women had been uh, freed by this time, uh, they were no longer slaves, uh, they ended up uh, almost being completely erased from this building that had thousands and it's not unlike you know uh poly so it, it wasn't uh 150 objects these are thousands and thousands of uh of of different uh things that were in this in this exhibition and, there was a power uh, battle wasn't there in the running of it Oh, there was a there was a tremendous who... battle in the running of it, um, and and then you know it came down to uh, these and and I emphasize this for a particular reason for to the sorts of administrative decisions like for instance. Um, you know, finally, an African American woman was hired at one point to uh, organize and curate all the uh, entries for uh, for um, exhibits coming from Black women all around the country. But then there were budget cuts, and this woman's job was one of the jobs that was cut. So you ended up at uh, back at square one, where you know once again there was nobody to curate uh, these exhibits and. That was then used as a reason to leave out those exhibits, right? So in the end, there were no, and so I begin with this story so that if uh, a black woman, a contemporary black woman, or a woman like me, uh, a brown woman from the subcontinent, uh, tries to look for herself in the story of this world's fair. Uh, black women would have to look in the Haiti Pavilion because that's where African-American activist Ida B. Wells was told to be. Um, and <clears throat> they, she was distributing a pamphlet called Why the Colored American is Not in the World's Fair of 1893. And if it was a woman like me, we would be found in this sort of a uh, human zoo that had been created, uh, uh, you know, which had exhibits from South Asia, it had exhibits from Africa, uh, and, and, the, and the people, the brown women or the black men were told to sort of enact the most sort of exotic and savage version that uh, existed in the American mind. So, uh, you know, on the back of one souvenir book, if if someone went to this exhibition at the World's Fair, was that they could rank the women uh, in order of beauty, uh, the women of this pavilion. So they could literally go stare at these women and then rank them, uh, you know, based on what they thought were uh, women that were pleasing to look at. And um, I begin with with this with this story because it's a question of um, you know how much have we managed to change the narrative and of course it's very very um, it's it, it's very hopeful to hear uh, you know both you be and and especially Polly and the effort that went into this exhibition but the question of course is is that um, you know women like me are still not able to control the story of our of our own telling. Uh, even as I sit here, you know, we were talking earlier about where I was and I mentioned that I was in Indiana. And here in Indiana, at this very moment, uh, there are pending, there is pending legislation that would ban books 
like mine, because what this book tries to do is to tell the story of feminism uh, through the perspectives of the men who were erased from the story of feminism. And by that definition, it belongs to, you know, a category of, of books uh, that teach critical race theory. And critical race theory right now is in the process of being banned in at least 20 legislatures in the United States. So, uh, so this is an embattled book from, from the get go. And of course, it's not just the United States. Uh, you know, while this book is being being published in the UK, um, you know, I expect it will not be published, for instance, in France, where uh, critical race theory is once again, being banned, um, you know, with with oh. the sort of uh, tacit approval of the Macron administration. So, so this is an embattled topic because the question is how do I get back the epistemic material that made up my history how do I get I I mean you know it's interesting uh, that you say 700 objects I have not seen 700 objects about women in the subcontinent back when I was in the subcontinent uh, because, like I said, um, you know, the other the other woman that stars in the first few chapters of this book is uh, Gertrude Bell, for instance. What did Gertrude Bell do? Well, one of the things she did is that she dug up a good part of the Middle East, got all of those artifacts and took them uh, to the UK. And I mean, similar things were done, of course, by Americans who were well, part of archaeological. Place. Yeah. Because, right? you, there's, a, there's a key phrase that lets out there and it's about controlling the narrative and I think that's a, a really important theme throughout your book and one of the areas I was really excited and interested by was your study of, of NGOs, of global NGOs and of, of international journalism. Um, can you tell us a bit about that, about empowerment and wood burning stoves and this theme of controlling the narrative? Could you talk to that please? Right. Um, so controlling the narrative in terms of, you know, of course, in the NGOs uh, that, uh, you know, uh, came from research, but it also came from personal experience because I've been a uh, part of um, large NGOs doing transnational work, doing work to, you know, provide women with reproductive rights, provide women with, um, you know, uh, all dimensions of, of, of you know, all, all, in terms of like what it says in their campaigns. But of course, the problem is, is that within these NGOs, within the politics of the boards of these NGOs, within um, the understanding of how campaigns are structured, uh, it is entirely focused towards towards the donors and the consumers of these campaigns. And the donors are right I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to, to burst in, but I'm just conscious of the, the time limits that we've got. And there's some such powerful examples of it. I wonder if you could give one that illuminates. I think this. one powerful example that you definitely should take away from this is, you know, deals with the war in Afghanistan. And it involved a journalist who went to Afghanistan and uh, her, she had no background in Afghanistan, but she was sent there by the New York Times. And one of the things that she did is that she learned that the Taliban had banned schools. And when uh, she found out that there was a secret school that was being run by certain people in um, in Afghanistan, of you know, which were who, who were hiding from the Taliban, so she goes to this secret school, and what she does is she hides a camera. And with this camera, with this hidden camera, she essentially takes pictures from inside the secret school. These pictures are then published in the New York Times. And this woman wins a Pulitzer eventually for her work in Afghanistan. So all of this happens without a single person asking the question of, oh my God, you gave away the identities of people who were running a secret school. What on earth would happen to them once their identities are outed? Nobody asked this question. And, you know, I'll, I'll stop with, with, with just Which, this. That, that in itself is, is completely unethical and a, a, you know, and a, and a bad journalism, but the, 
the, the wider framework is 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 what you're illuminating with the you know the missing part being that it's the people who are in that story that should be describing the narrative Absolutely. and that's the point that comes again and again yes and there are different sort of arguments that are you know used to cover it up in that okay well i'm giving this news to the americans and that's what they're interested in or i'm presenting this exhibit to the french or the british and they that's what they're interested in but the cumulative result of all of those sort of individual concessions that are made by people in power is that you have a situation in which brown and black women are at the front lines fighting all the feminist battles. I mean, the secret schools, after all, were being run by Afghan women. And um, but they are nowhere in the narrative. So it's it's sort of, you know, an all encapsulating narrative of white and Western supremacy and nobility, particularly moral nobility. And, you know, the uh, you know, you you go around the world searching for what bits and pieces of news can be used to bolster that idea, bolster this idea of at first uh, colonial benevolence and now sort of aid centered benevolence in that you know first we saved the world uh by sort of you know giving people the railroads and 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 the english language or what whatever and and now we're saving the world by giving them food aid we're burning and stoves Right. Oh, yeah. And so it's clean. So yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the time running by and there is some there's a part of the book. Well, much of it's very personal. You've, you know, you've, you've put yourself in it. Um, and there's, there's a point where you reflect on conversations with women where you felt the pressure to to talk about performative sexuality to kind of prove that you're not an oppressed Muslim woman. Um, I just found that so striking. And I wondered if you wouldn't mind reading out that that short section. Ooh, um... I think uh, I don't. I don't have that 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 section pulled up in front of me, but I do want to speak about uh, this idea of performing. Uh, you know whether it's a kind of a sex positive image of sexual liberation or whether it is um performing this idea of that i'm i'm one with the gang you know i'm not i'm not going to say anything that's going to make white people look bad in in a in a very uh in pointed sense and um you know i mean and that that just that just comes from the ranking of cultures where white and western cultures are at the top they're most sexually liberated and hence empowered because that's the equation that if you're sexually liberated that's the sum total of empowerment and you're um, not uh, subject to the sort of dark and medieval type of ideas that per pervade other cultures and the other cultures are always cultures that are uh, formerly colonized and yes and so if you are going to play with the big girls it is very much considered that, you know, um, that I should say, oh, you know, if people are talking about all, you know, the bad date they had over the weekend, that I'm going to chime in and give a story of my own somehow or, 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 or talk about, you know, various sort of uh, the various ideas of sexual intimacy. I mean, that's all par for the course because it's part of performing whiteness. I mean, the point, the largest point of this book is that in order to be considered feminist in the world today, I have to perform whiteness. I have to adopt the language, the means, the content of conversations, the epistemology, the narrative of a white woman. And that's how I have to pre present myself. And, and that's what was happening there, that, that sense that you had to sort of prove your credentials and prove your- Absolutely, thinking. right? Because I'm a Muslim yeah. woman. I'm not wearing a, a, a hijab, uh, but I have in the past. And, um, 
the issue just really becomes is that uh, everything I do is an interpretation for what my politics might be. So if I'm not wearing the hijab, then I'm, you know, I have a greater chance of being a the the cool Muslim that's not sort of uh, uh, concerned with issues of spirituality or covering my hair or whatnot. Um, and and then you know I can go further and talk about how sexually liberated I am and. That that's going to get get me even more points in terms of like my my efforts to become white essentially um and you know the the book is just about the fact that this has got to stop uh feminism is in a dire place is 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 at a crossroads i would say uh in the world today a lot of black and brown women are are absolutely aware of everything that I've just said, but um, have no means of escaping that. They have no means of establishing, I mean, uh, two white women without sort of saying that the white women who are doing the work of reaching out are somehow, um, you know, disingenuous. So, um, so, that, so, so that's what we've yes. got. And it's, uh, I mean, I would end with a very particular and specific appeal to the British Library because it has the capacity um, far, far more than probably any other institution at which I will present this book to change this narrative and to provide, uh, you know, people who are doing this decolonizing work with this with the spotlight that in the past has been afforded to narratives of colonization that are based on you know re retaining this sort of glorified version of history um you know i think borders and uh divisions ha can be erased i mean we're having this virtual conversation from we are. there's 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 right. so much to unpack here Rafi, and i'm very very sorry to to jump in but so many things that you've said speak to what alison is also writing about feminism's in a bad place this has to stop alison's book me not you the trouble with mainstream feminism does go to some really uncomfortable places, Alison. It's, I'm gonna just jump right into some of the really chunky stuff. Um, prison as angry dad. Now I had read a little bit about carceral feminism from Lola Olufemi um, and, and, and how that informs the feminist debate. Prison as angry dad, can you, can you tell us what that means, Alison? Sure. Um, I mean, I think this refers to um, the relationship that white feminists have with the patriarchal system. So we know it oppresses us, but we want it to protect us anyway. So this is kind of a macro version of what Susan Griffin called the patriarchal protection racket, which is the threat of stranger rape that pushes us into the arms of our husbands or our fathers or the other family members who are more likely to abuse us. Um, and at macro levels, this protection racket mainly targets bourgeois white women. So our fear of sexual violence, which shapes our behavior and makes us kind of docile subjects of capitalism, drives us into the arms of the carceral state and it enables other kinds of violence in the service of capitalist accumulation. So protecting white women has enabled violence against colonized and enslaved men. It justifies contemporary border regimes and it legitimates the criminal punishment system that kind of puts away unwanted populations. So angry dad is the system and we have a relationship with the system which sort of replicates an abusive heteronormative family. Dad might be scary, but we're dependent on him as well. And I think white feminists can be quite infantilized in our relationship with the carceral state. And that's something that we need to understand and sort of work on. It does need work. Um, I noticed that you really annoyed the Daily Mail with this idea. <laughs> Not that that's hard to do, but um, 
for people that aren't familiar and haven't read into, into some of these ideas, and, and you pick on a really good example, there was legislation, um, Rafi, I don't know if you've heard about this, but a couple of years ago, there was attempted legislation around something called upskirting, where um, people put a phone up your skirt. And, you know, I mean, I know I've got teenage girls, it's rife in secondary schools. And so people were like, yeah, make it a crime. This is terrible. They should face consequences. And yet you, you, you're sort of subverting that entire instinct, aren't you? But yeah, it's a very I, hard thing for people to let go. It's very hard. And I think we saw that as well after the murder of Sarah Everard, didn't we? You know, who was raped and murdered by a policeman, but still kind of mainstream white feminists were calling for more power to the castle state, for street harassment to be made a, a crime, for misogyny to become a hate crime. And it's almost like we kind of can't let go of this idea that safety means the carceral state we're so deeply attached to it and I think that's what the book tries to do it tries to sort of go underneath um, and explore where those some of those attachments come from um, and of course as white feminists we've always been um, kind of very deeply attached to white supremacy. That was that was uh, connected to my next question question which is can you talk about feminists and the far right? Mm. Yeah, I mean, in the book, in um, in chapter six, I basically talk about trans exclusionary and anti sex worker feminism. I want to kind of distinguish between anti sex work feminism and anti sex worker feminism because I think you can have a critique of the sex industry, which I do, but still be very much pro kind of sex workers' rights. Um, and in chapter six of the book, I kind of explore how these these types of feminisms tend to come together and they exacerbate kind of what I call the political whiteness of feminism, which is to do with not only centering the experiences and narratives of white women, but also a kind of deeply threatened kind of positionality, um, which is very much about the victimized body, which is always kind of implicitly coded as white, um, and a will to power, which we kind of find quite easy to notice in white men, but in white, power. yeah, that's well, a I neat the term, isn't it? What does it what, is? What yeah. do you mean by that? Well, I, well, I mean, we kind of we can we can see very easily how white men, you know, in powerful positions or reactionary white men, kind of exercise this will to power. But we don't notice it as much in white feminism, and I think that's because in white feminism, it's exercised by proxy through the punitive power of the state. Um, and I argue that in trans exclusionary and anti sex work feminism, these kind of dynamics become quite extreme and they become so extreme that anti trans feminists in particular are prepared to ally themselves with far right groups to kind of promote that anti trans agenda. And we've seen this very much in the UK, but also over in the US as well with groups such as kind of hands across the aisle. Um, and I think white women have always been prepared to ally ourselves with authoritarian white men while our own interests are at stake. You know, look at our role in colonialism and empire, as Rafia talks about in her book. And as you cover in the exhibition, Polly, look at all the white men who, white women, sorry, who voted for Trump. And perhaps to ally with these authoritarian men, they have to suppress the knowledge that these men are not their friends and will abuse them themselves kind of given half a chance, but the anti-trans feminism in particular seems so single-minded in its kind of focus at the moment. Um, I mean, I do wonder as well if this is really about keeping all the others out, because you mentioned the Daily Mail, and I was kind of castigated in the Daily Mail by trans-exclusionary feminists about my abolitionist stance, so my prison abolitionist stance. And in that, they kind of expressed horror at ideas that have been expressed by black feminists for almost two centuries, if not longer. Oh, so I did not notice it when they said them. Well, I don't know. I'm sure they did notice it, but there's something about kind of that horror that just arose. And I don't know whether it was because a, a, a fellow white woman was saying it or because... I'm a trans inclusive feminist and it kind of all got caught up together. But I do wonder if the single minded obsession with trans women is really about keeping all the others out, because, of course, the idea of real womanhood is a deeply colonial project, which was used to oppress enslaved women, colonized women, as the science of sex and the science of race were co-constructed, um, as you say very much in one well, your book, roughly, but also in the Unfinished Business book, which is marvelous. Um, so I think this really is a, a border control project. 
I'm going to add, though, that to, to that um, trans rights, um, the, the, the heat of the, well, just the heat around it is, is curiously geographical in the, it just isn't happening in other parts of the world. So it's very white centric in comparison to, say, India. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there have been recent um, recent discussions in India um, where some prominent um, kind of quite privileged feminists have made anti-trans statements. And but the the kind of lines, and I'm not an expert on this, but the lines of kind of um, demographics seem to be going in, in a similar way, in that it's the feminists at the more privileged end of the spectrum who are more likely to be anti-trans. Um, and certainly in the UK. And I think in the US as well, it's very much been a white and middle class project because I think I think it was something you said right at the beginning, um, Polly, you know, there is no one kind of real woman. There are many different kinds of women. And I think that if you are part of a group that already recognizes that, then the trans, you know, the trans issue becomes somewhat different. You know, I mean, the people who are able to feel comfortable with the idea of real womanhood are people like me, um, you know, white kind of middle class. Examining those responses and understanding why they are. There's a very brilliant piece by uh, the writer, science writer Angela Saini in Prospect mm. at the moment on this exact theme. And she examines this, this, this um, inability to respond as, as perhaps um, being culturally determined to the extent that, you know, we find it hard to accept what we've never seen, she mm. says. Um, yeah. There's one thing that I wanted to pick up on. I find your book really exciting because sometimes you're writing about whiteness and you're being it. And sometimes that's really uncomfortable for you and for the reader. And it's just like, oh, and so naturally <laughs> the uncomfortable bit is the one I want you to read. There's a section on it in um, early on in the book. Would you, would you mind sharing that with us, please? Of course, sure. Okay. Um, I'm ambivalent about writing about whiteness. I'm concerned, as some readers might also be, that in critiquing whiteness from within, I'm trying to absolve myself of my own. I'm worried that I'm trying to be one of the good white people who perform what feminist scholar Sarah Ahmed calls a whiteness that is anxious about itself and see that as anti-racist action. And deep down, that might be the case. Whiteness is wily. White supremacy is so embedded in our psyches that we end up doing it even while we claim and believe it is what we oppose. You are entitled, even invited, to make up your own minds about my motivations. But regardless of why you think I've written it, I hope you find something in this book of value. And if not, I'm happy to be told I'm wrong. Knowledge is always partial and we learn through dialogue with one another. We do. And can I just ask, where are all the royalties from the book going? Oh, they're all going to projects focused on sexual violence, which are um, led by black women. And I've already been able to make some donations, which is lovely. Um, oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, keep buying it, everybody. Please do buy these books on, on the platform here. You can also submit your questions via the platform if there's any questions you'd like to put to my brilliant panel. I want to move on now to a very special performance. We're going to take the personal and the political all the way with a performance from the writer Shelley Mitchell. Shelley went through rehab 10 times, got clean in 2016, it's fair to say she is not afraid to put her own life on the page. And since 2019, she's been performing with an organization called the Outsiders Project. They're an arts organization that was set up to show that people who have been sidelined from society can write, perform and create work of outstanding quality and worth. Shelley Mitchell reads her poem, Spencer and the Stairs. Spencer and the Stairs. In the only Jamaican pub in Luton, you stood among the cannabis smoke, pool cue in hand. You looked like a short, chad version of Jimi Hendrix. You asked to borrow a pound, and I knew I had to have you. You stood a foot shorter and 20 years older than me. You winked and said, I'm not afraid of heights. Although the smallest person in the room, in my mind you became the largest. But heights didn't matter that night on the stairs in the high-rise flats. Even two steps up you towered over me. I didn't see it coming. My face connected with the bottom of your Dr. Martins. You made animal noises. I made out the word slut. My legs gave way first, 
but it was the crack of my jaw on the concrete that vibrated throughout the tower block. I lay motionless, a trick I'd learned. I lay with the pain and held it close. I tasted rust and blood, but I lay perfectly still. I sensed your face next to mine before I smelt the rum and anger. I hoped you still loved me. Fear and piss filled my nostrils and my head cried blood over the stone steps. The floor began to shift in soft waves beneath my eight stone body. Your footsteps faded away after a parting gift to a kick to the face. My eyes stayed shut. I drifted. Time flew like water and I remember no more. Hospital lights rise me from unconsciousness. My secrets hidden well beneath my black eyes. I tried to make jokes with the nurses, but the only punchline was my foot swollen face. I find an abandoned wheelchair, away from the doctors, and make my way to a payphone. I hold my breath until you answer. And then I tell you, I'm sorry. Writer Shelley Mitchell, reading her poem, Spencer and the Stairs. And Shelley is part of the Outsiders Project. Um, so many massive questions flow from this reading. Um, the first of which is around violence and even a um, deeper internalized violence, which means that the writer apologizes at the end. Um, Alison, can you respond to this in the context of your many years working around understanding of sexual violence? Um, sure, I mean, I think that's incredibly moving, that piece, um, incredibly affecting. I almost feel I don't, you know, I, I, I don't have anything to say yet. I haven't kind of managed to formulate anything yet, but um, of course that is an incredibly common dynamic um, that somebody once described sexual violence to me as a process by which somebody else puts their hate inside you. Um, and I think that that is a really good kind of description for how it can make you feel and how deep the shame can go. And, you know, at the end, when Shelley says, sorry, I was almost waiting for that to happen um, because that is so, so common. One of the other questions that comes out of this for me is, is the question of class. And when we talk about the evolution of, of white feminism, self-centering feminism, corporate feminism, savannah feminism, all of these things towards intersectionality, this is um, a missing and very elusive part of the debate. Um, Rafia, is that something that you can respond to? Um, yes, and in my book, I do... Uh you know, speak at length about the redistributive aspects uh, that are essential within a sort of revived uh, feminism that is more uh, staunchly and more significantly focused on, um, you know, on, 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 on solidarity. Um, so, um, so yes, I, I see that, but at the same time, um, you know, in sh like to me as a brown woman, when I when I see um, what uh, you know, when I, when I when I heard her poem and how uh, poignantly it was expressed, I also think about the women that I worked with. In uh, you know, I've been a lawyer at a domestic violence shelter, and um, you know, and the added burden that my black and brown uh, clients who were at the shelter faced in that they felt that their case of, of domestic violence and abuse was not going to be, it was, it was almost like, on one hand, it was the issue of their own safety, right? And, and getting the police to listen to them and their own credibility. Um, but on the other hand, it was like, almost like a substantiation of a larger societal prejudice that black and brown men are responsible for all the violence, particularly intimate partner violence in society and what you know Allison uh, talked about in terms of um, 
you know, this, uh, the protection of white women. And I think that that is an important thing to consider, even where we consider the, uh, the passage of legislation relating to sexual violence, sexual assault, to prevent, the, uh, prevent sexual assault, we, um, you know, we, we, th there is no provision for the fact that for a particular victim, the same law might mean something quite different from, uh, you know, from from what it might mean for a white woman. Um, and that's, I think that's that a that very that's valid point. But I do want to stick to the idea of class because class is something that, you know, does does travel across races as well. And Polly, is there anything that you wanted to add into that debate at this point? I mean, clearly, uh, Rafia and Alison have got first-hand experience of working with domestic abuse uh, survivors, and I, d I don't. So, um, you know, to speak to that poem is really hard for me, and I found it find it very affecting. I suppose this kind of the only things you know I would say about the kind of question, the intersection of class and and race, is that they're not. You know, they're not necessarily, they're not in competition with one another. They're, they're, they're in conversation and they're structuring one another is how I would understand it. In fact, I'd look, I suppose, to Lucy Delap's recent book, Feminism's a Global History, where she talks about um, the necessity to sort of look at charting out sort of passionate, painful, strategic coalitions, but also contestations and differences across racial and class lines. So it's not to... And, and that seems to me to be really important. And in the exhibition, I, I, you know, I hope we paid attention to, and again, I say all the time, it is not the definitive exhibition. There are things we could have done differently. There are other stories to tell, but to try and pay attention to some of those complicated intersections. I think, yes, and Rafia, to return to the point you made about, um, about uh, say for example, a victim, a victim of assault, being treated completely differently from the get-go and through the judicial process is completely valid. The question I was kind of driving at around class is, is, is more on the sort of representational front. And I'll share, Alison, very interestingly, when I invited you onto this panel, you said, I don't do all white panels. And, you know, that's a really positive action. Um, how would, theoretically, though, how would one extend that idea to, you know, how fa fantastic if it's a fully diverse panel, but can you prove that the people that are there aren't all got PPEs from Oxford, got the, you know, descended from Rajasthani royalty, whatever it may be. What, what question would you even ask? What I'm driving at is, is it's so much harder. The class. Yeah. yeah. So much harder, so much harder. And, you know, I mean, I say I don't do all white panels. That's something I've made a choice to do because I, I can't go around banging on about white feminism and then be somebody that that do, does an all white panel. Um, it's not to criticise that. I just no, I'm no, no. Have to extend on it. Of course, yeah, but it's. I mean, I know it's a very imperfect. I mean, uh, Rafi, as you say in your book, it's not about representation, and you can't kind of run every event saying I'll have one of those and one of those and one of those and one of those. You know, I mean, that would just be pointless. So I think I. I don't know what the answer would be to extend it apart from to just think about it as as much as you as you possibly can and of course if you're if you're speaking about a subject then certainly make sure that you have people who have experience of that subject whether that's kind of class inequality or sexual violence or sex work or or whatever um but yeah it's it's very difficult and representation is not the answer is it um it's it goes deeper than that it's Let's about the ideas out. Which is the point that Rafia makes about controlling the narrative and who's the person right, that you decide to have. Yes, Rafia. I, would, I, I want to add that what I'm talking about is, uh, you know, and towards the end of the book, I deal very particularly be with your question. And that is, is that in our current framework, we have an inordinate uh, emphasis on recognition or representation rather and no uh, emphasis on redistribution and the fact is is that both of those are essential if we are really looking at creating um, a feminism that is about justice so that you know justice cannot just be about me being I don't do all white panels either um, 
but uh, but it cannot just be about having me or any other brown or black person on a panel. It has to be thicker than that, even as a philosophical concept. It has to have a dimension of redistribution, and that requires uh, sort of making state policies intersectional in terms not just of who they put up and who's represented, but also in terms of who gets what. And that is sort of, I mean, you know, it seems kind of an idealistic, uh, far away goal at this point, but that is, you know, the ultimate sort of end for these, con these uncomfortable conversations that we're trying to have with the best of intentions about, um, about these issues, about the erasure, about silencing, about not being on a certain kind of panel and not being a certain kind of curator. So ultimately, you know, uh, it's going to have to be more than that sort of very thin idea of tokenism or thin idea of representation. It has to be more. Um, some questions are coming in. There's one for you, Alison, and I'm, I'm going to. Um, and apologies to the questioner, Francis, um, but we, we're we very short on time, so I'm just going to say, can you answer this one really quickly? But it's someone who challenges the idea or questions the idea that feminists who are concerned about trans activists are not necessarily opposed or anti-trans. Can you can you address that? It's a complex debate, um, and the the question that points out it doesn't help to point the finger at other feminists in a public place. Can you can you answer that? Sure. Um, I mean, I don't. Is that a question or is that just a comment for me? Um, <laughs> yeah. What's the question? What's well, the, the question? question? Is, have you talked one to one with feminists, trans people, or non-binary people who are concerned about the trans activists? Of course, of course. I mean, I do think there's a there's a big difference between having a conversation about difficult issues and having this very toxic debate, which tends to be playing out in the mainstream media, mostly the right wing media and social media about trans issues. I mean, what I would say is that to have a conversation, you have to kind of start from a place of mutual respect and in the debate as it is playing out online, I don't see much respect coming forth for trans people's identities and trans people's rights. Um, I would also say that the platforms that prominent trans exclusionary feminists are now kind of being published in the Daily Mail, the Spectator, the Times, Unheard, Spiked, um, are not platforms that I would give any credence to in terms of having a constructive conversation. So I'm happy to have a conversation with anyone who wants to have one with me about any issues within feminism. And actually, I Thank recently you. wrote a letter on my blog to gender critical feminists. Um, there you go. Check out, check out the check blog, it, everybody. Check it out. Check it out. Um, there's another question. Rafi, I'd like to direct this one to you, please. And it's from Kara Cruikshank, who asks about the situation of women in Afghanistan with the troop withdrawal. Um, what ideas or vision can, can, can support these women? Rafia. <sighs> You know, wow, that, <laughs> that's a tough question, but it's a timely one. Uh, you know, just yesterday I was looking at an interview that Gloria Steinem gave in November 2001 when the U.S. was marching into Afghanistan. And, you know, she expressed hope that the U.S. would, um, you know, somehow be able to produce peace and produce democracy in Afghanistan. And of course, we've all seen the seen the result of that. And, um, you know, I think that in terms of um, what can be done, I think nothing can be done until white feminists recognize that supporting the war in Afghanistan um, and, and imagining this top-down feminism through which you are going to bomb this country and suddenly it was going to become feminist uh, is, is an utterly bankrupt idea and it's a lethal idea. Um, and 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 also recognize that when interventions like that happen, uh, no matter the the noble intentions that might uh, precede them, 
the result of of it is 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 always the same which is that you completely annihilate local feminisms indigenous feminisms and you completely you know make the idea of empowerment uh, sort of entangled with bombings and entangled with neo-colonial domination and that's where i've gone very contested term in your book isn't it actually i wonder if then um if, if i may you know condense what you've just said into an answer for for our for our audience member um read afghan women rather than other people writing about them perhaps is that something you'd in terms of a recommendation uh, I think the recommendation needs to be to unravel this idea that you can take feminism and export it to other countries. Uh, I, I think even the idea of read Afghan women has kind of been, I don't know, um, it's it's been misused within the American context by, you know, all sorts of American women going over there and, and then saying, well, we're telling their stories when really they're telling the story, their own story. Um, so so I would say, um, you know, pushing to this idea of 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 knowing that you can never you can never export feminism, which currently I would say is white upper middle class feminism, Western feminism to, you know, whether it's Afghan women or any other sort of women. Um, that idea, like, let's just put it to rest and bury it today. Well can start by buying the books, everybody in the right. audience, for sure. Um, there's one more question, and Polly, I'm going to give it to you, and then we're going to say goodbye because we're almost out of time. It's a really easy one, Polly. How do we achieve feminist goals practically when we have to operate within a patriarchal state? You can do that in a minute, Polly. <laughs> I'll tell you, well, here's one way. To buy Raffia and Alison's books because they are fantastic pieces of intervention challenge and they are practical they are full of brilliant examples uh they are yeah fantastic so i that there's a place to start um i think to know that it's the longest revolution to coin juliet mitchell uh we're chipping away at the granite hard face of patriarchal capitalism um there's been progress there's been some progress for some women but i think when you think about as mm -hmm. alison raffia makes so clear when you look at intersectionality, it's much harder to make that claim with racism so rife. So to think about the progresses that some women have made, but many women haven't. And to think about, you know, where is where does the work need to be done? Where does the conversation need to be had? Keep moving, keep chipping away. And I'll say one more time, buy these books, come to the exhibition if you possibly can. Um, and Thank you for joining this free British Library event. If you feel like donating to the British Library, it's right here on the platform. And we're also very happy to hear feedback about what you liked, what you didn't like, what you'd like to hear more of. Please do get in touch. Last of all, huge thanks to my brilliant panel, Polly Russell, Rafia Zakaria and Alison Phipps. Also, Shelley Mitchell, thank you very much from The Outsiders Project. And my lovely producer, Jonah Albert. See you all next time. Bye. <laughs>